Hello, everybody, and welcome to this FANS special interest session hosted by the UK Dementia Research Institute on key questions in dementia research. My name is Giovanna Lalin, and I'm the Director of Scientific Affairs at the UK Dementia Research Institute, which is a UK national network for dementia research directed by Professor Bada Struper. As you all know, dementia is one of the biggest challenges of our times. There are almost 50 million people affected by dementia globally, causing huge costs to society estimated to be around 800 billion euros per year worldwide and there is still no therapy available. So in this session, we will be discussing about some latest advances in dementia research and some key outstanding questions that need to be addressed to accelerate the translation of research findings into new ways to tackle dementia. So I am delighted today to introduce our four speakers, Professor Bardas Ruper, who is the founding director of the UK Dementia Research Institute. He is an Alzheimer's disease researcher and supervises a group based at the Crick Institute as part of the UK DRI Hub at University College London and at the AB Laboratory at KU Leuven in Belgium. His research is focused on translating genetic findings into mechanisms of neurodegenerative diseases and drug targets. So he's best known for the identification of presenilins as the elusive gamma secretases, and more recently for his work on the cellular theory of Alzheimer's disease. He's the recipient of several awards, including the Brain Prize in 2018, shared with other speaker John Hardy, Michel Godel, and Christian Haas. Professor Karen Duff is a leading expert in Alzheimer's disease and the tauopathies, for which she was awarded the prestigious Potomkin Prize in 2006. Her interests span a range of research areas from discovery science through to therapeutic approaches. And over her career, she has created several important mouse models for Alzheimer's disease, tauopathy and synucleopathy. And her greatest contributions have been in the area of pathology propagation and associated functional decline. From a position in Professor of Pathology and Cell Biology at Columbia University, Professor Duff has recently joined the UK DRI as director of the UK DRI Hub at UCL. Professor John Hardy is a leader in the genetic analysis of Alzheimer's disease and other dementias, known for the discovering mutations in the amyloid precursor protein, APP, gene that cause early onset Alzheimer's disease. Of course, its, it's discoveries of genetic mutations have had a dramatic impact on understanding not only Alzheimer's disease, but also more recently, other neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's disease, progressive supranuclear palsy and motor neuron disease. His career, including positions in the UK, Mayo Clinic, National Institute of Aging, Bethesda. In 2007, he joined UCL, and uh, in, uh, Utah, in 2019, he also joined the UK DRI hub at UCL. He's a recipient of many awards, and among these, the Breakthrough Prize in 2016 and the Brain Prize in 2018. And finally, our last speaker, Professor Giovanna Malucci, is director of the UK Dementia Research Institute Centre at Cambridge and professor of clinical neurosciences at the University of Cambridge, also an honorary consultant neurologist at Adam Brooks Hospital. She generated the first adult onset mouse model of prion protein knockout that paved the way to her discoveries about reversibility of early neurodegeneration and underlying mechanisms, particularly on the role of the unfolded protein response in neurodegenerative disease and its pharmacological manipulation as a potential new therapeutic approach for Alzheimer's disease. She combines clinical work and basic research and has led groups at the MRC Prion Unit and the MRC Toxicology Unit before moving to Cambridge in 2014. She has received numerous national and international awards for her work, including a Cyan 50 Award for Leadership in Research as one of the top 50 scientific innovators worldwide. So each speaker will give a short talk on their recent work, and we will then open the Q&A sessions at the end of the last presentation. So I hope you enjoy the talks, and uh, we hope to have a lively discussion after the last presentation. Thanks. I'm going to share the screen now. Here you go. So I guess I'm the next speaker, so maybe you can give me the next slide. Um, so when I, I joined uh, um, three years, or when I started three years ago uh, um, with the Dementia Research Institute, I would never have dreamed to have in such a short time such a fantastic team together to work on one of these major problems uh, of our society. Uh, as you can see on this map, we have now seven centers uh, and we have about uh, 500 researchers working on different aspects of dementia. It's multidisciplinary and we try to, to work together with clinicians, pharmaceutical industry, uh, clinics, medical doctors to find solutions. And I mean with solutions, not only therapies, but also treatment, support and diagnostics for uh, the different diseases that cause dementia. Um, I will now talk a little bit about my own research uh, to, in, in, uh, to introduce uh, a discussion at the end of this talk. Talks about 
about what we should do in the future. Uh, next slide, please. It's a bit slow, I, I have the impression. So, um, as Giovanna alluded already at, uh, my work is grounded at this moment in the idea that um, to understand Alzheimer's disease, we need to understand how the cells in the brain react on the biochemical lesions in the brain, the amyloid and the tau pathology. And so this is a decade long process. And so it must be a very complicated uh, action and reaction process, which gradually leads to uh, brain atrophy and dementia. And I think there's a lot of confusion in the field uh, where the biochemistry and the dementia are used as the characteristics of Alzheimer's disease while the treatments are all focused on the cellular phase uh, without much uh, concept behind it. Can I have the next slide? So I think that to make something meaningful in this area, we also need to link our research very closely to the genetic findings, because that's the bridge between our models, our cell models and our mouse models and the disease. Um, and you saw a shadow of the, of the typical GWAS studies which uh, support this type of genetic studies. Uh, the only remark I wanted to make there is that there are not only these 40 high, well, uh, or canonic genes which have been officially declared as Alzheimer loci or Alzheimer genes, but there are many thousands and thousands of SNPs in the genome which are associated with a certain level of risk for Alzheimer's disease. And so when you study Alzheimer's disease in mouse models, which is rather difficult uh, because none of the models is complete, and that's also the reason why we use, uh, when we try to mimic the biochemistry, we use amyloid, black mouse or tangle mouse. When you study these mice, you find very interesting differences. Can I have the next slides? So here you see a graph of the differential gene expression. I don't want to go into the details, but if you do look to the x-axis, so you see the changes in the tau mouse. Uh, these yellow dots are mostly uh, genes involved in neuro, neuro, um, uh, in, in neuron function. If you look to the y-axis, you see a lot of blue blue dots, and these are the genes which are changed, which are up, up regulated in the APP mouse. And so you see a very clear difference between the type of genes which are affected by tau pathology and by APP pathology. And the point I basically want to make here is that many of these blue dots are actually genes which are located in the gene, gene, risk gene, in the risk loci for Alzheimer's disease. So most of the genetic risk, risk next slide, most of the genetic risk as found by GWAS studies basically points to genes which are associated with amyloid plaques or with amyloid pathology and not with tangles. And they point in the first place to microglia for the cellular response in Alzheimer's disease. Next slide. And so this brought me back to an old question, what's amyloid plaques in fact doing in Alzheimer's disease? So there is a lot of discussion whether they have any meaning. Some people say it's a dustbin. Some people say it's not important. Some people say it's the oligomeric beta, which is important. But basically when you're looking for instance, this mouse model, which is the knock-in model uh, from Saido, for amyloid pathologies, you see that it accumulates over the months, from three to 18 months. But if you look, for instance, to the astrocytes, so these are not the, the microglia, but if you look to the astrocytes uh, in the lower panels, you see clearly these green cells, which show a huge response to the amyloid plaques over time. So there is clearly something happening around the amyloid plaques in this mouse brain model, uh, as it happens in the human brain. And so we decided to use a new technology to look what actually happens around these plaques. Next slide. So we decided to use four years ago, so the, the technology is in the meantime already evolved, but we uh, contacted Lundeberg in Sweden uh, to help us with spatial transcriptomics. And here you see three slices of a mouse brain. The two outer slices are used for stainings and the middle slice is used for transcriptomics. So every dot you see on that slide is a an uh, 100 micrometer diameter spot and you capture the mRNA of a slide which is 10 micrometer thick. So we have a cylinder of uh, 100 micrometer diameter and 10 micrometer thick and you can capture about 7,000 genes per spot. Next slide. And so we have more, we have now done this over, over many, many mouse and you get here a 
typical Disney plot, as you know, from single cell stuff, but every dot here is a tissue domain, uh, as I just explained to you. And just to show that these um, uh, spots are meaningful, you can see here at the left, in the middle, uh, middle uh, uh, drawing, you see all these spots clustered according to color, according to brain region, and just focus on the red part here, you see that these dots clearly cluster according to the different hippocampal areas in the brain. And at the right side, you see when we um, uh, color them according to the age or the genotype of the mouse, you see that they nicely cluster together according to age. For instance, gray is the wild type at three months, uh, month, blue is Alzheimer's disease at three months. Next slide. And so very important, of course, is that for every tissue domain, we have also an annotation of the load of amyloid uh, uh, around that tissue domain. So we know how much amyloid is exposed to the cells in the small uh, cellular, we call it the amyloid niche. Uh, in, in every, uh, so we know how much amyloid there is in every uh, tissue domain which we are investigating. And so you can see a very nice distribution from low exposure to very high exposure as indicated in the figure plaque index per spot. Next slide. So we can now ask a lot of questions. We have 10,000 transcriptome profiles from four time bounds from wild type and knocking. We have a regional annotation for every tissue domain. We have a plaque index uh, by uh, monoclonal 6010 staining. And we can ask uh, what happens in this plaque niche. Temporal resolution, early, very late. Uh, genotype, transgenic, or, or I mean knocking versus wild type and spatial resolution, and here we, there are many questions you can ask here, but we focused here on close to plaques, so what happens in the amyloid plaque niche versus distance to plaques. Next slide. Next slide. So here you see uh, uh, a summary of the analysis. So we, 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 we uh, did a lot of uh, WGCNA uh, analysis to see what genes are um, um, changing together uh, because uh, that's functioning together. So, and here you see two of these WGCNAs um, uh, in detail. On the left panel, three months, you see a lot of red dots, um, which are all rhododendrocyte related genes. And you see that these spots are upregulated according to the plaque index. So, the y axis is the plaque index. And you can also see. Um, 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 and so, so what we, we conclude here is that this oligodendrocyte module is upregulated already very early in the plaque pathology. And as you can see at the right side in the B panel, at 18 months, this module becomes downregulated. On the other hand, you see a very nice module, a purple module, which is um, centered around the, the, the crossing of the X and the Y axis. So it's not changed at three months, but at 18 months, it becomes heavily, uh, strongly upregulated. And we call this, this um, uh, network, this gene network, the PICS uh, for plaque-induced genes. Next slide. And so this is a, a very interesting um, uh, picture, actually, a very surprising picture. Um, here you see, again, all the genes in this PIC network um, at, in the wild type, uh, the A panel. Um, this circle is a circus plot, and you see how the different genes in that network link to each other. Uh, in the wild type situation. And you see that it falls apart in three sub-networks, a green one, which are mainly astrocytes, a blue one, which are mainly microglia cells, uh, microglia uh, genes, and then uh, the gray one, which are genes which are not really in the network in the wild type situation. But when we expose the, the, the tissue domains to increasing amyloid, and that's from Q1 to Q4, so quartile, quartile one to quartile four, with quartile four having the highest amount of a beta exposure, you see that all these different genes st start to get strongly interconnected. Um, and it goes gradually with the increasing amyloid plaques. And the most interesting aspect here, and I cannot go into the details, but the most interesting aspect here is, for instance, these dark lines which link astrocytes with microglia and with specific genes. So for instance, the APOE gene is very strongly linked with complement uh, genes in the microglia. So, slide. Next slide, Juan. So as conclusion and, and uh, previous slide, please. So as conclusion, and, and unfortunately, I don't have the time to go into details, but this work is in, in present, will be soon uh, available for, for, for reading in detail. 
So in conclusion, we identified several gene regulatory networks uh, which are induced by the amyloid plaques and which, uh, of which I illustrated the PIC network, plaque-induced genes, which is a gene regulatory network which links microglia, astroglia and oligodendrocytes in a coordinated response towards amyloid plaques. So next slide. So um, yeah, um, this is basically a series of questions for at the end of, uh, of the different seminars. I'm just going to read them uh, um, and you can think about it. So is neuroinflammation good or bad in Alzheimer's disease? Is dementia a good criterion for case control studies? Why are we not more persistent in exploring amyloid as a drug target in Alzheimer's disease? So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Bart. And uh, yes, these are the your founders. Um, and then, uh, yes, thank you. And uh, over to you, Karen. Thank you, Ivana. Um, so I'm going to discuss uh, some findings that we've been following up on. And it's a field uh, in, in ne neuroscience, especially in disease neuroscience, that I think is really uh, starting to attract more attention. Um, and this is the idea that there's regional and cellular vulnerability uh, in the neurodegenerative diseases. And by that, I mean that there's, there's vulnerability not only to uh, the pathological proteins that accumulate in a lot of these neurodegenerative diseases, but also to the, to the uh, toxic effects of them so that those neurons are lost. And this is a common uh, aspect of, of the neurodegenerative diseases. And this uh, picture shows you um, a review article that John Hardy and, and I wrote with my colleague at Columbia, uh, Ho Jong Fu. And it shows you the different uh, cell populations that are impacted in the different neurodegenerative diseases. So you can see that you know, multiple different areas are impacted by neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, I, but they're, they're often different. There's uh, some overlap, of course, but they're often different. And within those regions, there's also a vulnerability of particular populations of, of cells, and they could be either neurons or, or glia. And you see in the table uh, some of the uh, proteins that deposit in these, in these diseases, the areas that they're in, and the vulnerable neurons that they impact. And one of the things I wanted to sort of bring out here is that there are both similarities in terms of the fact that uh, areas are particularly affected by a particular protein, but there are differences in that not one, you know, one, one, um, one type of pathway doesn't, that's deficient in these diseases does not give rise to the same proteins being deposited. So for example, a common feature of neurogenic diseases at the genetic level is that genes involved in clearance pathways, such as autophagy uh, or uh, ubiquitin proteasome clearance, are often impacted uh, and causes of the disease. But that, core, that genetic lesion does not give rise to the deposition of all of these uh, aggregating proteins, which are all uh, uh, targets of, of autophagic uh, clearance, for example. So you, know, you don't get tau plus Huntington plus A-beta depositing in the brain of a, of a patient who's got a mutation in, say, a chimp gene uh, or some gene that's involved in, um, in, uh, in clearance. So this is interesting, and I think this what this tells us is that there is selective um, vulnerability that's really specific for that particular cell type, um, and a combination of things have to come together for you to get degeneration uh, or to get pathology in that particular cell type. It's not just one pathway uh, is, is impacted in all the diseases in the same way. Uh, next, please, Giovanna. So... Talking about Alzheimer's disease, and I'm going to specifically concentrate on the tauopathy aspect of Alzheimer's disease uh, because it's the uh, it's it's the um, it's the most trackable uh, in terms of where the tau pathology starts and where it it progresses to in the in the Alzheimer brain. But when you look at uh, the regions that are affected at what stage in the disease, and this table uh, from 2019 uh, sort of gives you an indication of which brain region is impacted which cell type is in that brain region and what stage it's, it's impacted. And you can see that the pathology moves through different brain regions uh, as the disease progresses. Uh, next, next, please. The pathways that these tend to be impacting uh, that could be giving rise to uh, the, 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 the deposition of the proteins in these different areas are listed around the outside. And they range from things like maybe there are uh, vulnerable neurons that all uh, share the common property of having um, 
high metabolic activity or high firing rate. Perhaps calcium stasis is the reason for the vulnerability of that cell population. Proteostasis, very uh, 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 prone to, to uh, clearance problems. Maybe that vulnerable cell population is very prone to clearance problems. Maybe the morphology, the axon length or myelination properties make a, a neuron vulnerable or resistant. Endosomal lysosome is another common pathway that might make uh, uh, be common to vulnerable neurons or cellular response to cellular stress. Next, please. To address this, we used a computational approach uh, and looked at the vulnerable cell population to tau pathology and Alzheimer's disease. And that's the excitatory neuron population, especially in the enterial cortex, uh, hippocampus, and out into various layers of the neocortex. And we used a computational approach, and I don't have time to go through it, but here's the paper, uh, the Nature Neuroscience paper that described it. And we looked at what gene sets were common to excitatory neurons, especially in the regions which are prone to develop tauopathy very early on in a disease. And to cut a long story short, we did an analysis to try and identify the master regulator genes that perhaps were driving this selective vulnerability of these excitatory neurons. And here, shown in this uh, hub uh, analysis uh, uh, representation, are the genes uh, that were most likely to be driving pathways. Uh, there are a couple of different um, pathways that were being driven. One of them was uh, involved in autophagy, and you can see that BAG3 down there in aggregate protectors. BAG3 was a gene that was highly, up -regula highly uh, regulated in invulnerable neurons, but not vulnerable neurons, suggesting that it was protecting those invulnerable neurons. BAG3 is an autophagy-related gene, so clearance was probably better than those in those resistant or invulnerable neurons. What was interesting about this, though, was that clusters of genes went together in these vulnerable or invulnerable uh, 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 cell types. And I think what's important to, uh, to realize here is that it's not just one gene is important. It's going to be whole orchestras of genes coming together in a particular cell type that's going to give you either vulnerability or resistance to a particular protein depositing in that. Next slide, please. And this brings us to the question of why, uh, you know, why is it that certain cells are, are, are vulnerable in one disease and not in the other, even if that protein is the same protein in those different diseases? So on the left here, you see three different tauopathies, three diseases that have tau pathology as a primary feature, uh, Alzheimer's disease, PSP and Pick's disease. But you can see from these sort of heat maps on the, on the brain uh, cartoons that the region that's affected early on and the region to which the pathology spreads are different in those two, three diseases, even though tau is the primary uh, protein that's affected here. And I think what this is telling us is that these, there's, there is specificity, even uh, you know, to, for people have different sort of uh, fault lines that perhaps will direct the tau protein to uh, deposit in a particular cell type. And I think what this tells us is that we've got a lot of specificity uh, that actually directs a particular neuron's vulnerability. And we're gonna have to take care of that when we're thinking of drug targets. And I'll come back to that in a minute. You not only have a uh, specificity of what, ta what a uh, neuron will develop tau pathology, but this, this little uh, figure on the, on the right indicates that for Alzheimer's disease, amyloid or A-beta is probably driving that pathology. And that, that A-beta is probably triggering uh, the accumulation of tau uh, to move out of the entrenal cortex and into the neocortex as it does in early Alzheimer's disease. And so now you've got a disease where amyloid has to come into the picture and drive tau uh, in, that, in that particular trajectory. And this is, again, now you've got a, a sort of vulnerability of a neuron, probably in the entrenal cortex, to that type of tau accumulating and being driven out of that neuron. So there's a lot of specificity with neurons. And the last slide will sum this up with some questions that we should be thinking about. So how does each person's genetic makeup influence their vulnerability to a particular disease? We've seen a lot of different genes coming together uh, to, 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 require, to be required in one neuron to then, to then show a vulnerability to a protein sort of depositing in them. So different people's genetic makeup is probably gonna drive their vulnerability to a particular disease. 
the reciprocal of that is how does the genetic makeup influence their response to drugs? And this is something that we're going to have to be very careful about. And perhaps we have to think really more carefully about personalized medicine, targeting a drug to a person's particular uh, genetic makeup. Should we take into account the molecular makeup of a cell, uh, a cell population that's vulnerable when you're designing a drug? So for example, should you take into account that not every pathway that's uh, going to be cleared by your drug, uh, not, not every protein that's going to be cleared by your, your clearance drug is going to work in that cell population of interest. So do we need to be a bit more careful and make sure our drug uh, therapy targets the particular neuron of interest? And lastly, how can we better identify common but key druggable pathways that are effective in those vulnerable neurons? And here I'm talking more about that uh, hub analysis and trying to find key regulators that act in our, our vulnerable pathways of interest. So those are a few thoughts to take home, uh, selective vulnerability, how it might impact drug design and response to drugs. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen. And uh, now over to you, John. Thanks for, uh, thanks for inviting me, Giovanna. Thanks for, thanks for the introduction earlier too. And thanks for listening. So I'm going to say something actually very simple, I think. Uh, I'll start by saying that I've always been a little uh, kind of concerned that when you went to Alzheimer Congresses or Parkinson Congresses, uh, what you found was that there was the molecular biologists in one room talking about the detailed molecular biology, and then the epidemiologists in another room talking about the epidemiology of the disease and there was really no connection between the two and obviously since we're talking about the same disease there must be um, there must be a connection and I think we're now beginning to see what the connection is and I'm going to actually say something very simple next slide Bear with me, <laughs> sorry. Well, I'll start to say it before the slide comes up. I'm going to re... So what I'm going to say is that all of the diseases, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, and the tauopathies, all of them can be directly caused in a Mendelian fashion by the overproduction of the proteins we all know about. Alzheimer's disease can be caused for, by gene duplication of the APP gene. Uh, the tauopathies can be caused by a gene duplication of the tau locus. And Parkinson's, the synucleinopathies, can be caused by gene duplications of the synuclein locus. And those are rare cases there are also point mutations in the same genes and in the case of Alzheimer's disease in presenilins as well. And these point mutations actually have very similar effects. So the point mutations in APP and presenilins either increase the amount of A-beta, which is the initiating protein, or they reduce the solubility of that protein. The point mutations in the tau gene uh, incre either increase the amount of four repeat tau uh, by altering the splicing, or they um, make it more likely that the tau protein will fall off microtubules and thereby increase uh, the free con the free uh, free concentration of tau in the neurons. And and with synuclein genetic variability in the normal population influences one's risk of getting disease. So we have a very similar situation in all of these diseases. Uh, all of these are highly exp expressed proteins. All of them can be caused by the production of too much of the protein, uh, too much of the initiating protein, uh, and that can initiate the disease. And I have to say these uh, points have been to some extent made by the, uh, the, uh, the Cambridge group uh, led by Michelle Vendra, I might pronounce her name wrongly, Vendra Sklolo. Apologies for the mispronunciation of her name. 
So this is, and this has influenced my views on things. Don't now wait, then. I'm just, I'm just trying to re restart the PowerPoint because it- I Don't worry, I'm on a roll. Don't <laughs> maybe you can share your, your, your screen if you want. Oh yeah, can I share my screen? Yes. Right, if you want, you can share your presentation, yeah. I've got another, okay, just give me two. You keep trying, you keep I trying. I keep trying. <laughs> I, I can share mine, one second. Who's sharing? I don't know who's sharing now. Alex is sharing. Let's go back. We don't want to hear you're giving people the punchline. <laughs> <laughs> so now what about now we've gone to GWAS. What are we now we've gone to GWAS. What are we seeing when we start to look for risk genes as uh, Bart mentioned? Well, what we're seeing, uh, as Bart mentioned, is in, in Alzheimer's disease, and all of these, I'm making a general point, and there are exceptions, but most of the loci, most of the loci are microglia, and many are lipid metabolism, and many are both microglial and lipid metabolism. Some of the risk genes influence APP metabolism, but the majority are microglia and influence lipid metabolism. In Parkinson's disease, the GWAS, uh, many of the GWAS are lysosomal. The most famous, of course, is glucocerebrosidase, but uh, there are many lysosomal genes, and, but some of them are involved in mitophagy. And I won't have time to, to discuss this, but the uh, Parkinson's disease I've put into um, uh, brackets because actually, I think there are there is uh, in Parkinson's disease. There's more of a case for the being. I won't say two forms of the disease, but certainly a gradation across a wide range, a wider range of etiologies. And in the tauopathies, and here I'm talking about PSP and CBD, which I regard, if you like, as the sporadic versions of the uh, FTD tau mutations. The data is weaker uh, because the GWAS have got uh, much fewer cases in them. In Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease, we're well into the tens of thousands of cases, whereas in the tauopathies, we're only at the level of about 1,000 to 2,000 cases. So we have far less, far less, um, far less loci. But what we're seeing in the ones we do know about uh, 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 ubiquitin proteasome and the uh, unfolded protein response. So we, these are the genes we're seeing. And what we're not generally seeing, so that, again, there are always exceptions, is things which directly alter the expression of the genes, the, if you like, of APP, synuclein, or tau. Next, next slide. So we've done an analysis exploiting the, uh, it was led by Dervis Saleh. We've done an analysis exploiting our knowledge of this etiology to look in mice uh, to see if we can predict Alzheimer genes. And in fact, we can predict Alzheimer risk loci uh, uh, based uh, upon narrowing our field of study to those genes which um, whose expression is altered by amyloid uh, deposition. And this, these, these, uh, this paper is rather similar uh, in concept uh, to the one that Bart discussed in a minute. Next slide. A minute ago, I should have said. Next slide. So how can we put together this idea that the genes involved in, uh, in amyloid production are, are Mendelian generally, and those involved in, um, in the, as risk loci are, um, are, are microglial. And this is how I think we can do that. Uh, here you have amyloid processing. On the left is the alpha secretase pathway. On the right is the beta secretase pathway, and red is amyloid. Now, when you see this slide drawn generally, 
what you see is amyloid floating off into the extracellular space or into an intracellular vesicle. And yet all of us who have ever used amyloid in the lab, especially A beta 42, know that it is almost impossible to separate from lipids. So what I would suggest is that the A beta deposition occurs in, uh, initially in the lipid, as I show on the right hand side here. An A beta deposition begins in the lipids, and as it builds up in the lipids, it disrupts those, that lipid membrane. Next slide. Next slide, sorry. And it's, uh, it's to this, this uh, uh, amyloid deposition, which I think might be initiated by a longer A beta, which I draw with this, the darker red, which might initiate uh, the disease process. And what the microglia do, what the microglia do is react and repair that damage. Uh, and so they are, their risk loci are because, next slide, the da that damage repair process is, is, uh, is, is less efficient. It's notable that most of the microglial genes that we know about, uh, which are involved as risk loci, when we have a loss, when we have mutations which are associated with disease, their loss of function. And here I'm thinking of TREM2 and ABCA7 and so on. These are lipid genes, microglial lipid genes, where loss of function is uh, predisposing to disease. Now I'm going now to make this a similar point with regard to Parkinson's disease. I mentioned GBA before, and I said that overproduction of synuclein was uh, a, a risk obviously cause the disease. What I'll now say is that, that when we look at, uh, well, GBA as a starter, GBA uh, and synuclein are, are part of a bi-directional loop as shown by Dimitri Crank. And if you have loss of function of, of glucocerebrosidase, it makes it more likely that synuclein will build up. And if you overexpress synuclein, it inhibits GBA and lysosomal activity. And this is by no means re restricted to GBA. We know now that many other lysosomal genes are involved. So what I would say in Parkinson's disease, certainly the Lewy body form of the disease, is a similar thing is happening. That it's a failure to clear synuclein, which is largely the problem. Next slide, please. As I said, with tauopathies, we're not in quite as good a state because we don't have as many risk genes. But as I mentioned, what we're seeing when we do know the risk genes is that many of them are involved in uh, the ubiquitin proteasome system and the unfolded protein response. I think we're going to hear about um, the unfolded protein response from Dr. Malucci. And uh, Karen has already mentioned the ubiquitous proteasome system with regard to tauopathies. Next slide. Uh, and this is her, in, uh, her a really groundbreaking paper showing that proteasome was important in, uh, in, uh, tangle, uh, in restricting tangle formation. Next slide. I just now, I have a very simple overall thesis, which is, as I've said, influenced, but perhaps goes a little further than the work that came from the Cambridge uh, group, uh, that all of these proteins are, are, are close to their deposition point. Producing more of them causes disease. Redu the risk genes are involved in the major degradative pathways. The major degradative pathways are different in each case because the proteins are in different cellular compartments. I have to say that, um, of course, microglial protein degradation 
ubiquitin proteasome degradation and lysosome protein degradation are not entirely, we, we say they're separate pathways, but of course they're not. They're pathways with many interactions. So I'm sure it will be more complicated than this very simple-minded view of things. But these are the, I would say, the overwhelming uh, initiating factors in sporadic diseases. Now I'm going to say a last sentence, which is maybe we've been going the wrong way. We've, you know, one of the problems about the amyloid hypothesis, which I've always been worried about, is that really showing amyloid toxicity has never been has never been uh, really convincing. Uh, and maybe that's the wrong way of thinking of it. Maybe th these, uh, the overwhelming problem is a failure to clear because of a damaged and weak clearance system. And these are the proteins which are closest to their, to their, uh, their, um, their if you'll, as I've said, crystallization point. And maybe there's nothing special about the sequence of these proteins, maybe the special thing is that they are so close to their solubility threshold. And uh, I think this is also a, a mechanism for joining the epidemiology with the molecular biology of the diseases. We should be thinking perhaps of things in Alzheimer's disease which lead to membrane damage, things in Parkinson's disease which lead to lysosomal inhibition and things in the tauopathies which uh, uh, maybe cause uh, ubiquitin proteasome inhibition. And think that, uh, by that, I mean things in the environment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. Um, Giovanna, now. I'm going to share my own screen, if that's OK. Yes, please, Alex, can you please uh, stop sharing? Yeah, you go away. <laughs> Thank Sorry, you. Alex, with all, all, all uh, respect, just so it's just easier, I think. Let me just do this. Um, thanks very much, um, Giovanna, for the invitation. It's great to, can everyone see that? I think so. Yes, we can. Good. Excellent. Um, yes, th thanks for the invitation and thanks for the opportunity to discuss um, uh, this very important issue with everybody here. Um, I've had a bit of introduction really from John and, and Karen, um, but let me just, I'm gonna, because we've got such a short amount of time, I'm just gonna focus in on one of those stress responses, the unfolded protein response, um, which as both Karen and John have alluded, are important in um, handling, in, in, in neuronal survival and handling the stress of the misfolded protein. So um, if, if you take any of the diseases, we get away from the specificity and just talk about the general generalities, um, the, they are characterized by a decline in synapse number, which parallels the early loss of cognition, memory, early movement in Parkinson's. The earlier signs are uh, reflected by the early loss in synapses, um, of which there's plenty of redundancy. So there's a long silent phase, as we all know. Um, and is followed by neuronal loss. Um, and the, the, the structural plus the, the loss of um, synapses is important to trophic support to neurons. So then they're, they're not just essential for memory and, store, and for functioning of, of, of neurons, but also for um, survival of neurons per se. In parallel, you, you all know, and you've heard from John and from Karen and, and Bart about the misfolded protein accumulation, which could be up. A beta, tau, alpha synuclein, TDP43, whatever you want, any of those proteins, these processes are going on in parallel and they, and they speak to each other. There is an effect of the uh, misfolded proteins on the, on, the, on the viability and the number of synapses and on neurons. But cutting through all of these are the stress responses, of which there are many. Again, Bart talked to you about microglia and inflammation. Caramental autophagy, and I'm going to focus on the unfaulted protein response or the integrated stress response, uh, which is a, a, a absolutely standard cellular response to misfolded protein accumulation. Um, and I want to make the case that actually there are many ways that we can intervene in the course of dementia, and this curve is the most important 
curve that determines um, morbidity, symptoms, hospitalization, or institutionalization and death. So this is the early phase clinically prodromal memory loss, still functioning, still at home. When you get into neuronal loss, you, you're looking at steady decline, progression, institutionalization, and, and untreatability. So really, we're, we're after this, this phase of, of disease, which is reversible and interventional, and all we need to do is, is flatten that curve. Oops, sorry, let me just get, flatten that curve to, off, to delay the onset of neuronal loss, which would change the experience and the, 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 the severity of these disorders for many elderly people. It's not going to cure, it's not going to take away the amyloid, it's not going to make everything go back to normal, but it will absolutely modify disease. So this is a really pressing and possible um, outcome for dementia. So the unfolded protein response is one of these pathways. Um, I won't go into any depth, except to say that the misfolded proteins that we've been talking about, whatever they are, activate a number of responses. And in this case, at this particular branch, which has uh, been dis, you know, pursued by groups all over the world in all disorders in, and, and seen in human tissues and in mouse tissues and mouse models. But this leads to activation of a signaling cascade that ultimately leads to reduced protein um, production, reduced translation, which in itself contributes to the death of neurons um, in already comp highly compromised sick cells with low synapses, full of misfolded protein, dysregulated autophagy, dysregulated mitochondria, microglia, um, all activated. This is the final blow or one of the many contributing blows that a whole body of work worldwide has shown that if you modulate this and rescue, rescue this, which we pioneered in fact, but, but um, um, you can prevent that neurodegeneration. And the, the the, the phosphorylation of PERC and 2-alpha absolutely uh, decorate brains with um, Alzheimer's, with PSP, with Parkinson's, with TDP4, with, with ALS. Um, it, it's, it, and in, in, um, in AD, it parallels the Brock staging. So it's very much um, a, uh, a, an accompanying feature pathologically. Um, and a number of uh, genetic and pharmacological studies from labs all around the world. I put one up because otherwise this, this slide would be so full, um, show modification of disease. Um, and we uh, found that, that this small molecule that inhibits the phosphorylation of PERC um, prevents neurodegeneration and clinical uh, disease. And uh, here you can see the profound neuroprotection uh, this is a control hippocampus. This is a degenerated hippocampus in prion disease. These are mouse that have been treated with the drug inhibiting PERC. So all the misfolded proteins stay, but you're just re restoring protein since this. This is a tauopathy mouse. Um, and this was hailed at the time as a breakthrough, as a turning point because of the application across the spectrum and because of the capacity to disease modify. And just worth showing you very quickly the, the clinical effects. This is a severely end-stage prior disease mouse, absolutely akinetic, not moving. He's, he nearly fell over there, he's ataxic, he's got a wide stance, this spastic posture. This, the mouse that's got the exact same level of protein misfolding load and, and toxic stress um, has been treated with a drug and is completely normal. And again, this is very end-stage disease. You'll see how, oops, how profoundly, or maybe not, that's not gonna, but fine. So, very neuroprotective restoring protein synthesis and it's been done in many labs with a number of small molecules uh, ranging from the PERC inhibitor which is toxic to the pancreas and can't be used in humans but as a proof of principle um, it's, uh, it shows um, high protection and then also other drugs which act slightly lower in the pathway let me just go back here um, one is trazodone, but experimental drugs at ISRIBS and a great deal of drug discovery around those. Um, but um, we discovered a, a repurposed drug, a licensed safe antidepressant that's safe to use in elderly people. That we, use, we discovered that this drug, trazodone, does the same in um, the same as you've just seen in those videos in, in mice with several neurodegenerative disorders and it's been used by other groups also. So basically, um, the, the approach here is to block signaling through this pathway 
to restore translation to a safe level that isn't toxic to other tissues. Um, and this is now um, ready for clinical trials uh, for dementia and Parkinson's disease. So my real interest here is um, in getting, is, is, is accelerating translation. Um, it's great having discoveries, it's great having nature papers, it's great finding new pathways, but we've got to test the, the meaning in patients. So we've got to be prepared to be wrong, but we've got to learn from this and we've got to do experiments in uh, people. And, 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 and so for us, that experiment would be a clinical trial of trastone. That's me. Stop share. Thank you very much, Giovanna. And um, I think we already have quite a lot of questions from the audience, I have to say. So without further ado, I would say I would uh, just uh, leave space to the audience question. So a first question for the, from the audience is, uh, um, why is age such a powerful risk factor for all neurodegenerative disorders? What happens at about 70 that leads to a great increase in incidence? So this is quite a general question. And uh, I would say probably... Can I have a go at this one? John, I guess. Oh, sorry, Karen. I think you wanted to go too. But, uh, John, and, John and Karen, yeah. Age okay. before beauty. Actually, I think it's because for the reason I kind of half intimated that that damage builds up. So, you know, having, for example, uh, one GBA gene when you're 25 is enough. But by the time you're accumulating damage when you're 65, it's no longer enough. You're getting more and more damage. And that, that's the type of answer I would give. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. As I said, you're just accumulating. Everything's impaired and failing. And then you've got this extra stress. Um, and, you know, the regenerative and repair capacity in age is massively affected in any tissue. And the brain in particular, because there's no very little replacement. So, so it's particularly vulnerable. Karen, did you want to answer? Yeah, I mean, one of the specifics with aging that we're looking at is the uh, dysfunction of the uh, clearance pathways, and they certainly go down with age. So if you're at the tipping point, as John described, you know, where these proteins can tip over the edge of solubility, uh, any sort of anything, any reduced ability to clear them uh, would 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 lead to to them depositing. But I think we've we've been looking at sort of region and cell type specific um aging effects on on proteostasis and and there's clearly differences between cell types and brain regions do you want to say anything bart yes i wanted only to add that 70 years is a bit uh, a bit mis mistaken uh, because uh, we know that this disease starts very very uh, alzheimer's disease in particular is already 20 years before you get get any signs of or clinical signs. So this process is already a long time busy. And that adds to the idea here that you have a progressive failure of your systems with aging. Uh, starts, in my opinion, already around your 50s. Okay, good. Thank you very much. So another question. I'm trying to pick up the more general questions so that uh, you, know, you can maybe all uh, you know, provide an answer for our audience. So uh, one on, uh, uh, given the changes in the ubiquity in proteasome pathways in some tau opathies, what are the speaker's feelings on protax under development for tau that aim to remove tau by using small, small molecule degraders to induce ubiquitination and degradation? Would you like Karen or Giovanna? Yeah, I mean, I, the protact field is is remarkable, and I, I would love to see it uh, succeed. I don't know very much about the the uh, realistic uses of protax for clinical use. I, um, I mean, I gather there are some problems with with trying to either get them into the brain or or trying to use them uh, in in people. But it's a great idea. Yeah, I mean, you can then focus exactly your degradation you know, ubiquitin ligase to the, exactly to the protein you're interested in, and perhaps even couple it as a, some kind of tag uh, that you can image with as well. So no, I think it's got great potential. Giovanna, did you want to comment at all on this? No, no, I agree. I think, uh... Another, yeah. 
Another question, general question on uh, animal models, I have to say. So could you all comment on the amount of variable animal models that are about and where should the field go forward in relation to models? It seems like there are more and more new models that appear every day and a lot of debate about what is a good model and what it isn't. So the question should definitely drive the model choice, but um, uh, with tens to hundreds of models within the same category, APP genetic mutations, et cetera, it can get really difficult. And I guess with the suggestion that protein clearance would be could be influencing AD onset, should we move away from these models that overexpress mutations? Who would like to go I first? Would say definitely, <laughs> if you can. You know, I mean, a lot of it is just uh, pragmatic. You've used what was available, but as we get these new knock-in models uh, with you know more physi with physiological levels of the protein, and we start to age them properly, and uh, you know, I think that's the way to go. Yeah, we'll see some results. You know, but that's better. something to, to say. So I, I think that uh, uh, one of the confusions is there is no, no model for Alzheimer's disease apart from the patients, and that goes back to what Giovanna is saying, uh, was saying about testing in final testes in humans. So every model mimics a part of the of the thing, and I think that people don't think enough uh, what exactly they want to do with the model, uh, and for what the model is made. Uh, that's my first point. The second point is that uh, we see now more and more interesting humanized models. And I think that's a good way to go forward because you have, uh, for instance, with the knock-in models, you have a lot of the overexpression artifacts and insertion artifacts, which have compromised quite some work in the past with other with overexpressing models. And the third thing is that uh, um, we see more, and more work to model the disease in human human-based cells, iPSC cells, and I think organoids, but also genetic uh, mice, which uh, go uh, a certain way in the direction to understand how the complex genetics influence certain aspects of the disease. And last but not least, uh, something which I'm watching very closely, uh, here in Europe, we are of course not able to really work on that, but I think that we should reconsider the use of um, primates um, uh, for specific questions, and I know that there's a lot of ethical uh, things to be clear there, but if we talk about fast experimentation in human, we also might think to do part of that in, um, in, in primates, because it's probably the only brain which approaches a little bit the brain of a human being. Giovanna, you had, a you had a comment on this. Yeah, no, I mean, I think all these points are relevant. I think the other real thing for modeling is, remember, mice only live two or three years. So whatever we model is very limited. I think, in a way, what, one very strong thing to model is pathways or processes. So dysfunctional autophagy, dysfunctional proteostasis. And actually, you can use those across diseases. I have a, a project with cancer biologists. We use the same mouse for the same, for, I'm looking at the brain, he's looking at the gut. And, and uh, it's very, very useful. And we have very strong phenotypes. And I think the other, we have to get away from thinking we're going to get a perfect mouse model. We're not. And we have to do what we've all talked about, which is this iterative reverse translation. Do an experiment in a mouse, do a small experiment in humans, go back to the mouse, back to humans, and learn that way. And agreed, put, put uh, primates in at certain stages if necessary, that, that might well have to happen. Um, but we have to, we're not going to be able to work in mice indefinitely and then get the answer in humans. It's not going to happen. Um, maybe, I, thank you, Giovanna, thank you all. Uh, I have one maybe for John. Um, do you think epigenetics will become more important in dementia studies? Is it more important than typical GWAS studies as this genome doesn't change from birth while epigenetics will change with age? Uh, well, uh, I don't think, well, I don't think anything could be more important than genetics. Let me start by saying that. But let me also say that, uh, uh, you know, when the first epigenetic papers came out, I took a decision that we weren't going to do any epigenetic analysis because I thought it was just uh, hype. And let me say that I was wrong. And there's been a very, a very beautiful series of papers, for example, uh, in Alzheimer's disease, showing uh, how much epigenetic marks uh, in microglia, in isolated microglia, are really complementary and expand upon genetic analysis. So I started by being very suspicious of epigenetics. I wish I hadn't been because I wish I'd st we'd started to do it and we didn't. Uh, 
you know, I think there's really, there is really uh, a, 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 an important role for it. I'll also just say that we have a very good group in Exeter working on epigenetics. And, uh, you know, their papers are worth looking at. I think they have been very important in the field. But that definitely, I wish that we had started to do epigenetic analysis. Bart, as a, as a comment. Yeah, yeah, because uh, I, I share the, the prejudices of John uh, and I've also changed completely my mind because I think it's really also providing a link between cell biology, mechanisms of disease and genetics. Genetics tell you where something happens, the cell biology tell how something happens, but there is not always a clear link between the two. And so, um, for instance, we know now that these different cell states of microglia are very important. And we can describe them at a the transcriptional level, but um, you can also describe it at the epigenetic level, how these different microglia, for instance, adapt at different states. And some work with uh, Chris Glass in the States is, is, is propagating. And I like that very much because if you can induce a cell state by epigenetics, you can also reverse a cell state by uh, modifying epigenetic markers. And I think this is really a very promising area of research. Okay, I think we just have one question more and time for one additional question before we have to close the session. There is one about uh, what is your opinion about usage of bioactive phyto phyto phytochemicals like resveratrol and probiotics as additional therapy to targeted protein degradation, for example, in neurodegenerative diseases? Anybody wants to take that one? Bart, uh, you're smiling. I'm a big user of resveratrol. You're a big user of resveratrol. <laughs> <laughs> Every evening after five o'clock, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> I have no idea. I think, I think, I think in general we are much too conservative in the in the neurodegeneration field, um, um, and uh, we should, like Giovanna said, test more, much more in in patients. Uh, the only remark I would like to make there is that we also need to be careful in our definition of patients. We should go. We should learn from the cancer field where we go for mechanisms. And uh, you test the first trials are not about therapy, but are do we hit the, 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 the mechanism we are investigating? And so um, in that sense, I'm a little bit hesitant about this type of drugs because the mechanisms are very general, which you try to aim for. Um, but on the other hand, it could be a complementary therapy. But I like, I like trials where you uh, select a few patients based on very good um, mechanistic insight where you can test whether the mechanism is tested and then uh, the mechanism is affected and then you can move into bigger clinical trials where you use stratification to use those or to include those patients where you have a certain degree of certainty that that mechanism is contributing to the overall disease process. So. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm sorry I couldn't take all your questions, but thank you very much for joining us during this session. Thanks to all the speakers. And uh, check us out on our website, UK Dementia Research Institute, and get in touch with us if you're interested. And uh, thanks again for joining